we do the Christmas concerts to perform the Christmas album. We, we made our first Christmas album in uh, 1992. And um, the year that the album came out, we did, a, we did a tour with it. And it was a lot of fun, it's because it's the only time we get to sing the songs on that album, or the two or three weeks that, that precede the holidays um, after Thanksgiving. So we, we would go out on a little 10-day tour. Uh, and it was always nice. It was uh, snowing in the Midwest. and. It's sunny the, in LA. It's sunny in LA, but it was. But we always had fun doing it. Uh, we didn't do it every year, but but pretty much. Um, but but I, again, I, I I think it's it's the only opportunity we get to sing those songs, and, and we love the album, so we, we enjoyed doing that. We did this uh, album with, with uh, Johnny, so all the arrangements uh, were written by him. So it's uh, it's wonderful to hear the charts, you know, to have a full orchestra and to be able to you know to hear what he wrote. You know, so it's a lot different. Like Tim said, it's a lot different than what we usually do during the year. So it's a nice change. The Manhattan Transfer is based on a four-part harmony sound, which was very popular in America, American music. And it was popular music of the 30s and 40s, uh, and um, especially. And it kind of fell out of vogue for, for a while. Uh, this this particular kind of harmony singing. I mean, we 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 we're a harmony group. We we, we I guess if if you had to be very simplistic about it, that mines some some uh, underused loads of music of American uh, culture, uh, and, th and there's so much it within that. We don't really um, confine ourselves to one style. I think that's the defining feature of our group. Probably the first vocal group to come along that didn't. Except maybe the Kingston Trio. Mm. Uh, we we don't we don't really define ourselves stylistically within within the realm of four part harmony and American music. We do bebop, we do doo wop, we do swing, we do vocalese, we improvise, um, we we do pop music, uh, uh, we do swing stuff, and um, it's a very very wide uh, range. And I think that's what's given us our longevity over the years. Because once you define yourself, it's it's very limiting, and you're easily disposed of. I think once you're you're finished with that. For me, I sing the melody most of the time, but to get that blend, and when you open your mouth and you hear a chord, and it's like a solid chord, that's the best moment. I mean, uh, soloists can't they don't they can't get that. They can't ever feel that. You open your mouth and you hear you hear a, a whole orchestra. You know you hear and and hopefully. You're, you're, and none of the voices will stick out, you know, if they can all mesh together perfectly. You know, we still have a lot of those moments. You know, but we're, we're also, I think what makes us a great ensemble is the individual voices. When you hear us against another vocal group or something, I'll, like for instance, if you go into a, like a clothing store this time of year, there's a lot of our Christmas music on these tapes that these stores buy. And I'll be walking in there, and you can't hear it. You hear it like you don't hear it, but you hear it. All of a sudden, I'll go, God, something sounds, oh, it's us. You know, you just hear a certain, like, there's a certain, what's the word? I'm ring? Like, there's a ring. There's, there's, there's a, a ring, ring that, sound. We, that yeah. our voice had, our voices, our voice, yeah. which is even a better way of putting it, that our voice has. That it's is, just like a signature. It's real devi definable, yeah. 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 It's absolutely true. If you took yeah. the same chart and gave it to four other people, it's it wouldn't sound the same. It would sound Never. very different. It's just a common. It's the nature of, of the beast. It's, it's, yeah. it's, all human beings sound differently. That's why uh, twins or brothers, like the Everly Brothers or the Osborne mm. Brothers, or any kind of family act, we have. A, that's why they sound so great because their voices are so similar that it just, it's just it's a very unique quality. We would spend a lot of time just really fine-tuning the phrasing. You know how we would phrase, how we would you know. Uh, you know, uh, balance the four voices together, you know, um, down to vibratos, down to breaths, you know, so that it really, uh, you know, was like taking four voices and making it one instrument. You know, that was really the goal for it. And I think over time, you know, it just, some, it's something that just kind of happens. You know, uh, we kind of lock into it, hopefully, you know. Um, so I think so. I think that's kind of it. But I, again, like I was saying, even with Cheryl, 
you know, when she came in. You know, um, singing harmony is, is something that you have to be able to hear. It's very, very hard to teach somebody, you know, well, this is what you're listening for and this is what you have to do. It's a long, long process, you know. It's, uh, it's something that's more musical, in a sense, to be able to just lock into a sound. So I think that when we sing, you know, especially when we're in a small place where we can hear each other, you know, it's really kind of locking into that, into the, the voices and, and how each part makes up that chord. People that do pop music, that sing pop songs, get their material from demos. And today, in the music business, people don't write songs, they write records. Usually when a songwriter presents a demo, I mean, the whole idea of the record is there. And, and um, the idea is pretty much that's what you do. Um, because when you hear something and you respond favorably to it, you have to ask yourself, why are you responding favorably? It's not just the lyrics or the chord changes. Or it's the whole, it's the whole, you know, the elements of the matrix, if you will. And that's the record. Um, but a band like us, we don't do pop music in, in that way because we, we're, we're kind of uncanny in how we pick our material. We pick a lot of stuff that's a lot of jazz tunes. We pick instrumental pieces that we write lyrics to, for vocalese and some old big band stuff. A lot of times when I hear something and I, I want to bring it to the group, I have to ask myself, well, what is it about what I'm hearing? What is it that I like? Because I have to make sure that it's something that we can do. In other, maybe there's something that I like about a record that can't be reproduced. Um, so I have to, you know, what, you know, if I'm going to bring something to the band, let's say if it's a little big band tune, or if it's a, it's a, well, what is it about it? Another part of our process, though, that's kind of un unusual, I guess, is that we, we usually write out what we sing. It's written out. Uh, it's, it's an arrangement. It's, it's arranged for the voices. It's not a free-for-all. I mean, you've got, a, you've got a, a specific part that you have to learn, and we rehearse a cappella without the band. So we do like four bars at a time, eight bars at a time. We sing it parts alone. We sing parts two at a time, three at a time. Then we sing it, you know, all together. That's the time-consuming portion of all this. Yeah, it's biggest, tedious. The biggest time-consuming yeah. portion is sitting around and singing over and over and over and getting the parts right. And, and once you get the part, then there's, the, then there's uh, other levels of finishing it, polishing it up, you know, blending, dynamics. Um. And then it's bringing in the, the music, the band. But I think whenever we sit down to write a vocal arrangement, um, I think in our minds we have the concept in terms of where it's going to go and how everything else kind of fits in. And then we'll either bring it to our musical director, Jeroen Gershavsky, or if we're recording, there might be certain people that, you know, certain arrangers that we just really like their style, and we'll bring them into the, into the project. Um, to add on top of what we do. So they have to, and it's always been like that pretty much, that the instrumental arrangements have always followed us. Before Manhattan Transfer, I was in a, um, a group, a female trio. Um, and I've been in female trios actually since I'm about 12 years old. So um, and that group was called Laurel Canyon and we were playing um, in Nashville, we were playing um, in, in New York City a lot, we played in LA. We, we were starting to get a little bit of recognition, kind of singer-songwriter and folk music and a lot of harmony and stuff like that. And I was in that group when I, when I met uh, this guy over here who was driving a cab. And that's how we met. What a segue. I know, I, I was right. setting him it's up, like see? Yeah, I was, I was, I was uh, one of those unemployed musicians trying to uh, Get, get my career together and, and pay my rent at the same time. So uh, <laughs> actually, I, I was working on a construction crew before that, and it was just, I was not made for that one. And I was, uh, the workload was, uh, it, it, it was so difficult that I get home at night, I was so tired, I couldn't do anything. And someone said, you know, you really, you should do what all the actors and musicians do is, is drive a cab. And um, I don't know why that had never occurred to me. It was, it was a great way to support myself while trying to get it together. So that, that's what I did. But before that, I was a, a marketing executive in a large manufacturing corporation selling 
ready to eat cereal to unsuspecting children ruining their teeth for uh, <laughs> massive corporate profits. I was doing that. I was going to what used to be Newark State Teachers College. I was a music major there. It's now Kane University. And in the summertime, I was working as a uh, MC slash activities director at a hotel in the Catskill Mountains, um, MCing for strippers at two o'clock in the morning. Oh yeah, baby. And then what when I what kind of activities? Huh? Oh, we had great activities. <laughs> yes, with Princess Suzanne. And Oof! All those Princess Suzanne. Suzanne. It was all very exciting. You never talked about her. Well, you never asked. <laughs> but anyway, uh, then when I graduated. <laughs> I, uh, I, I kind of went back into the business because I was in the business when I was a kid. I did a lot of theater and stuff like that. And I got in uh, an off-Broadway show called Grease. Um, and eventually we moved up to Broadway and I was, uh, uh, I, I created the role of Teen Angel in Johnny Casino. And it was while I was in the show that um, I met, uh, um, well, Roy Markowitz was, was the drummer in the show, and, and he was dating uh, our ex-partner, Laurel Massey. And then um, Tim had met Laurel and met Janice. They were hanging out. And then they were kind of looking to put a group together. And that's kind of where I came in. You know, um, I was like that, uh, the fourth guy that kind of filled in. I, I was kind of bored in the show. I was in it already about a year and a half. And this looked like it would be something that would be a lot of fun. So that was, that's kind of what happened. Mm. Strippers? Strippers, yes. I learned something new. Yeah. Well, OK, before I came into the group, I was listening to the group, which they can't say that because they weren't the group yet. <clears throat> but I, I had their records, and uh, I was in a swing band out of the Northwest for about four years. I call those my college years. <clears throat> learned a lot. Moved to L.A. and did Hoot Nights, the Troubadour, and the Blah Blah for about two years, and waitressing. And then one night I was coming out of the Baked Potato Club on Coinga in L.A., and my manager said, should I tell her, should I tell her? And she was looking at her boyfriend. I said, what? Would you like to audition for the Manhattan Transfer? And I went, yes! I didn't know whose part. I didn't care if it was the bass or the tenor. I didn't know. I didn't know. They didn't tell me. I just said yes. I'm a big fan of this group. I said, yes, of course, I'd love to audition. But I'd never sung with other voices, so it was, and yet, I knew, I knew them. You know, I knew their music. I knew, you know, I knew where they came from. I had all the records, and uh, just kind of slipped right into the, into the open spot, as it were, and that was 25, sure 25 years ago. I remember vividly the experience. Um, <clears throat> We were leaning against Janice's piano. Janice was sitting at the piano playing. I was to the far right. Alan was next to me. Cheryl was next to Alan. And we had, we had only, we didn't want to do one of these open cattle call rehearsal things. It just didn't want to deal with that. So we kind of were kind of quietly let people know that we were looking to re replace Laurel since she had resigned. And, and, and so we only ended up, I think, auditioning like 11 women or something like that. It was a very, very small number, but we didn't like make it a public thing. So um, we had, um, we, we said, okay, I think there were four songs that we asked them to learn. There was Four Brothers, Candy, I don't know, it was four tunes. What else? Do you, uh, you Can Depend On Me, Candy. Not Four Brothers. It wasn't Four Brothers? No, no that's, a, we, that's a big one. I had it ready, though. I oh, you had ready. it ready? Yeah, okay. I was ready for it, because I love that one. Yeah, that was it. Yeah. But I remember when we sang Candy, and, 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 and the three of us, we felt that, OK, it was important that uh, this woman, her voice should blend so we, have our, we retain our sound, that she can stand out and hold her own as a soloist, and somebody that we think we can get along with. I mean, that was, those were the, that was the, the, the three criteria. So when we sang Candy, I remember Alan and I were kind of and we're trying to get Janice's, and we're looking at each other like, because yeah. I think we knew, but I know Janice was busy playing, but Alan and I were next to each other, but we I know knew. he and I were signaling. We knew right away. We knew the minute, the mm. minute we sang together, we knew. And then we felt like this was a person that we could get along with. It's a yeah, nice Cheryl, lady. And Cheryl was the last person <laughs> to audition. 
Wow. I came later so in the had, day, too, right? You so guys we, were kind of we tired. we went through, yeah, like 10. Well, we didn't need We didn't need, we didn't we didn't need, need no, to audition anyone after but Cheryl. But they were really good, too. They were all really good singers, but it was like maybe there was one thing. Maybe they yeah. were good soloists, but they couldn't blend. Yeah. You know, it's something, it's, it's something that you can't teach. It's something just something missing. that you yeah. got to intuitively hear, you know? Pretty exciting uh, stuff. Yeah, but we knew Ooh. we knew right away, and she, and we I remember we broke out some champagne, and Cheryl even said later she said I didn't understand why we were drinking. You have to, but with the three of us were celebrating. It's like we found somebody. It was great. <laughs> Especially after we said, well, you know, sometimes we play in places that are very very small. There's only one dressing room. How do you feel about that? She <laughs> Did said, you say that? Oh, oh, yeah, I guess that's okay. And Tim and I said, all right, no problem. <laughs> no problem. I don't remember that. Uh, there you go. We don't live in the same city anymore, unfortunately. I really do kind of miss that because it's a great way to, when, when you're just casually hanging out, you know, sometimes you come up with some great ideas or you're just listening to music and, yeah. you know, if you can really just spend the, a, an afternoon a week together or something, it's, it's really great for a creative process, you know, as opposed to living in different cities and, and not being able to go to a movie or, you know, sometimes when you're just not even thinking about it, ideas will percolate. We felt we could really make this thing work when we got together was that there were aspects of each one of our own particular areas of taste that spilled over into other areas. Like Alan was on Broadway. I, I was not into Broadway at all by, by choice. I mean, I, I just was never interested. But Alan was into rhythm and blues vocal group music, as was I in a big way. And to a degree, so was Janice. She sang in a girl group that did that kind of stuff. But Janice and I were into folk music, but Al wasn't. Mm -hmm. You know, when Cheryl came in, serious background in swing, because her dad was a swing musician, I was into swing big time. You know, Janice was into like Coltrane. It, there were all different aspects. So, it's so that we kind of filled in each other's gaps, if you will, and, and each other filled in our gaps. So we learned from each other. Um, and we were able to bring that to the fore, um, which enabled us to do a lot of different styles of music. And I think we were the, f we're, I mean, we were the, really the first vocal group that came along that, that did, did not adhere to one particular style of singing. The Kingston Trio, like Janice mentioned, they, they got into um, a lot of different bags, if you will. Um, but they used one kind of basic harmonic sound, as did almost every vocal group that came along before us. But we didn't do that either. We, we changed the sound. We had different writers. You know, we, d we never use the same arrangers. Sometimes we do more than four-part harmony. Yeah. In the studio, that's, that's possible. Live it isn't, of yeah. course, but... We're so. really the first band... Unless you cheat. Unless you cheat. Which we don't. I think for recording, it's, it's, uh, it's a process. You know, we, we kind of figure out a, uh, you know, a direction for, for a CD, and then we all start compiling mat material, and we have listening sessions. And then we just, you know, we might start with, with 30 songs and then break it down to 15, 12. And uh, that's kind of how it works. And live, I think we, we just try to balance it because, you know, we have fans that want to hear hits. You know, they want to hear Birdland. They want to hear Boy from New York City. They want to hear hits. You know, so we just try to balance between, you know, like uh, we have a, a CD that's out now. We try to, you know, do stuff that's new and stuff that, that um, you know, that is more known, you know. And, you know, so we try to make it interesting that way, you know, not just do the same old, same old, same old all the time. We were really, really fortunate. You know, most of our career, we were at Atlantic Records. Ahmed Erdogan, who was the co-founder of, of, of Atlantic, signed us. So we were kind of Ahmed's group. So we had a lot of freedom, you know. They really allowed us. Amazing. Most of the time when we made, when we made a record, they, ne they were never around. We would just do what we were going to do, and then we'd hand them the product. I think, I think it was just sheer luck that our group coincided with Ahmed's personal taste, you know. Yeah. So I think that's maybe why yeah. he left us, yeah. let us be. I mean, it certainly isn't that way today. You know, I mean, it's so hard today to be creative that way, you know, because it's, you know, everybody's watching the buck, everybody's counting, 
and it's so um, you know so it became so homogenized yes. in, in a sense either that or they're taking these kids that maybe if they were in college they'd be groomed for something and they and the, I'm speaking specifically of this American Idol phenomenon which is l repulsive you know and 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 they become some wet dream for some record executive mm -hmm. to to try and uh, you know sell sell have songwriter royalties for their cronies and you know the, these these People are, are, I mean, they're okay singers, but you know, if they were in a high school choir, they'd like stand out, maybe, you know. I think, I think. Was that too harsh? No, it was great. I don't M think so. MTV, MTV really changed America's musical sensibility because it took, um, it took music from here and it put it over here. Uh, so after MTV, there, there was this requirement that you have to be good looking. Uh, according to someone's definition of what good looking is, be good. B, there, there was this to have a successful recording career, but prior to that, I mean, going back for years, I mean, like you think of a lot of the different male and female singers, I mean, Roy Orbison or Patsy Cline or, or uh, Ella Fitzgerald, I, I mean, they were not, you know, glamorous. Uh, people according to that kind of cosmetic definition, if you will, but nobody could sing like them. And then, and then, uh, kind of going along with what Janice said, when when MTV came along, it it sort of it was like a breeding ground for a lot of very attractive-looking people who were very mediocre singers. So that has become the standard now, um, and it's starting to change a little bit. Thank goodness. Um, but uh, that's my gripe with television anyway, with newscasters. I mean, everybody has to be good looking. It's like, screw good looking. I mean, I, that's somebody who's intelligent. Oh, God. Forbid. Man. Sorry. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't mean that. We're, we're usually pretty generous to, uh, to our fans. And why not? They're loyal. They've been with us for yeah. as long as we've been together. <laughs> then they bring their kids, and then their kids and bring scary. kids. And then, uh, yeah, <laughs> we have we have quite a few generations that have followed the. Group. I was a lot of people kept saying, "Oh, the Manhattan Transfer." Yeah, my, my my mother and father love you. And I yeah, go, yeah, All yeah. right, that's okay. But when it gets to like my grandparents love you, I'm out of here. I'm done. <laughs> that's it. 